All right. So let me show you kind of an interesting uh, thing. And it doesn't even matter what we're what the thing I'm coding in here is. And we saw I, I told you the other day I've been working on a, a my own quantum simulator. So I'm trying to represent a relatively simple quantum circuit like this. Doesn't matter. The, if I run that same thing on IBM's quantum computer, I get something that looks like this. And I'm trying to mimic their programming language Qiskit. So I get this thing where there's a 25% chance of zero or one, and there's a 25% chance of six or seven, whatever that means. Okay, so I see that at the beginning of a four hour run. <laughs> It's like, okay, so now I'm going to, I think my code's working. I'm going to test this. So my code outputs this. I'm expecting to be 25% in zero, 25% in one, 25% in six, 25% in seven. So you would, you would agree this looks different than this, right? It's actually not. Um, and it's something you'll you'll talk about in the 325 class, and I didn't even consider it, and I I hate IBM for it because I think it's lazy programming. This is not actually the number one. These binary numbers here are represented in what's called reverse ND or little endian format, which means that the binary numbers are reversed. Um, with the uh, least least important digit in the lowest place. So this is actually a four. This is actually a four. One, zero, zero. There's the four. <laughs> so it, it actually does match up. So... Um, uh, I spent four hours chasing this. I, I rewrote this thing called tensor product four or five times. Like there's some bug in this because I'm getting a result that very much looks like the results that I would expect to get. Like you probably wouldn't get a real percentage if you were really doing it, the math incorrectly. So I chased this down for four hours only to finally find out that, oh, this is in reverse Indian. So this goes, this is zero, this is four. Uh, this is two, this is uh, six, this is uh, um, uh, one, Th this is uh, five, uh, this is three, and this is seven. Like that's nonsensical, right? That it goes in that order. This is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That makes a lot more sense, right? But ultimately, it comes down to remember when we uh, were learning how to convert numbers from decimal into binary. And when you do it by hand, it ends up doing it in reverse. And then we had to go and reverse it to get the right answer. So if you think about this from an efficiency perspective, if you're someone building computers or, or something like that, writing an operating system, you might choose to just go ahead and work with them in, in reverse right? Leave it in that format. Um, so um, it was fun. It was kind of like playing a video game, I guess, sitting there chasing it. But I'm like, I felt like I was on crazy pills. I just kept rewriting parts of my program that I'm like, this works. I've tested this on crazy looking math problems. It functions, it functions, but I must be doing something wrong. So it happens to me too. Um, but it kind of falls into the category I, I've mentioned it several times, uh, and especially with the fraction example we're looking at, of problems where, um, so like, for instance, when if you were to run that fraction problem, not using the Euclidean algorithm, it could take a week to run or 100 years to run, depending on the size of the values you're working with, right? And you might get convinced that you're actually looking at like an infinite loop. Like you've introduced a bug into your code. You don't necessarily know that it is um just working <laughs> it's just taking a long time to work so you don't get that feedback so this happens to uh programmers as you are debugging your code some problems are hard to kind of stumble upon um so kind of always be aware of that where 
if you've looked at it a couple times and you really feel like uh, 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 you're you're doing it right, then start questioning whether there could be something else other than a bug going on. Because after I, I dealt with this for like four hours, it could have even been more. I don't know. I was in some sort of trance. I finally, I just, I, I sent this over to Waleed. I said, I basically sent this document. You know, I said, why is my result coming out wrong? <laughs> Here's my code. This is what the circuit looks like on IBM. This is what the outputs look like on IBM. This is what my simulator is producing. I told them the math I'm doing. Um, I told them the circuit it's processing in what order, blah, blah, blah. And probably within like two minutes, he replies back and says, it's stored in little ID. <laughs> So it's a, I don't know. He mentioned that he did mention that in class when he uh, um, was talking to you guys. So I probably should have put it on Slack. Um, but yeah, so that was that was uh, how I spent. That was Sunday, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at our homework assignment. I put it on here. We're doing structs. What was the assignment? Just to convert our current thing into using structs instead? Okay. So. Saved. Okay. Let me just make sure I'm recording. I'm pretty sure. Yep. Yeah. And let me I make this bigger. Is that like easier to read or does that start becoming problematic? I can't tell what your how bad the TV is for this. Like you can read that. All right. So um, last time we introduced this idea of structs, which are, we're going to call that, uh, for at least what we're doing here, um, the ability to create our own variable types where we want to hold more than one value could be of the same types of values, but structs don't require that. Uh, initially we were representing our fractions as two bucket arrays, call that a vector if you want, two bucket arrays where the first bucket, bucket zero was the numerator, bucket one was the denominator. We just decided that's what they meant, all right? Um, so uh, um, last time we introduced this idea of a struct where we can now create a variable. In this case, we're creating a variable of type fraction. Um, and we're gonna say a fraction holds a long numerator and a long denominator. And we can write a function called create fraction, which we had before, but before create fraction did what? It loaded the numerator into bucket zero. It loaded the denominator into bucket one. And we had to remember as the programmer that that's how we're storing our fractions, right? All right. So now create fraction takes in the numerator and denominator. It then creates a new fraction object. All right. And we looked at this at the end of class uh, last time where, um, uh, well, we've looked at this a couple different times now related to automatic garbage collection. If I were to create a local variable here, struct fraction pointer F2, let's say, and just left it like that. And I would say F2 dot numerator equals this, F2 dot denominator, well, actually I would say F2 arrow numerator equals that F2 num arrow denominator equals that because that arrow dereferences the pointer. Um, it's the same thing as saying, uh, just as a reminder, this is the same thing as saying star F dot numerator. Just as a reminder, that's what this syntax is equivalent to. So remember with pointer syntax star something is the value that lives at that address. So this is syntactic sugar for not having to write those parentheses and thing. It, we're resolving a double pointer, if you will. All right. So if I were to do this, I would was to replace this with F2. 
I wouldn't get a syntax error. This would be all just fine. And when I returned F2 here, it would end up returning in that exact moment, the fraction with the things loaded in. But what wouldn't happen is it wouldn't give us a, um, uh, it wouldn't give us the actual thing because the memory would be recouped. All right. Um, now I want to show you a couple of uh, things here. So before we dive into this a little further, I'm going to change up create fraction just a little bit for our experiment here. So I'm going to say create fraction is going to return an actual fraction, not a fraction pointer, an actual fraction. Now, remember, I've mentioned that in newer languages like Java and C Sharp, they've removed the special syntax for working with pointers. You no longer have an asterisk or that ampersand for, you know, working directly with memory addresses. Instead, it just does it behind the scenes for you. Okay, which is great. That's convenient. That's kind of like the automatic transmission in a car, right? It's convenient once you have it, but if you've driven a stick shift before, you appreciate what it's doing for you, that, that type of thing. All right, so now what we'll do inside of create fraction is I'm going to update this so it's going to return a fraction, not a pointer to a fraction. It's going to return an actual fraction. All right, so... Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and use my F2 in this example. I'll just comment this guy out. So now I'll say F2. This guy's no longer a pointer, right? So since he's no longer a pointer, we say F2 dot numerator. F2 dot denominator. Because we no longer have a memory address to, to resolve. To, well, I guess it's not resolve. It's dereference. We no longer have to dereference the memory address. It now is already the value. So f2.numerator equals numerator, f2.denominator equals denominator, return f2. I'm back here in my main. It's coming out as a normal fraction, not a fraction pointer. I can get the numerator and the denominator by saying f1 dot. I just happen to name my variable here f1, even though it's called f2 in here. Um, I can name it lol if I wanted to. All right, just understanding scope. This is a local variable here in main. This is a local variable inside of create fraction. What I call it inside of here is insignificant. What ultimately comes out of create fraction here is a value and I'm catching it somewhere. And where I catch it is that's how I have to refer to it from that point forward inside of main. All right, so um, let's actually give it a, a better, we'll call this guy answer fraction. How about that? much more typing. All right, so we'll go ahead and run this guy and we see that we do actually get our value. As opposed to, let's just take a, a step back before we had it as a fraction pointer was what it returned. This guy returned a fraction pointer. I worked with this guy. Um, but let me, um, actually, let me do this. I'll keep using my F2 here, but in the end, I can't return a fraction because this guy's expecting me to return a fraction pointer. So I have to return the address of that fraction. So notice I'm not using the malloc thing here, okay? I'm creating a local variable here. So I will get my fraction pointer out of this guy. And then I'll have to update this to do the arrow thingy. Like that, set it, that's fine. Return the address of that guy. That's what this guy is expecting. This guy is outputting that. Okay. Okay, so it's saying the address of this local variable is returned. So it effectively is doing the right thing. It's just hidden inside of some warnings. It's mentioning that the address of this local variable is returned, implying it's a local variable. That guy is going to disappear. That memory is given back 
to the operating system at the end of this guy. This isn't going to fly. Um, this is the automatic garbage collection stuff. And then we see down here when it tried to print it, it was it didn't print anything. All I would need to change in here is this, and I'll name that guy F2. <laughs> Oh, no longer past the address. Air type two. These are arrows because those are pointers now. And then we got our two. All right. So if we want to use pointers, we have to ask for the memory ourselves. If I want to use a straight fraction, I can return that guy. And there's my two that way. Now, for most of you, you probably like not having to use the malloc thing because that looks scary, right? But let's talk about the consequence. As I have it written right now, I'm creating a fraction, not a fraction pointer. It's a struct, a variable of type fraction that I invented, right? I'm setting its couple values. I'm returning that guy as a full-fledged fraction, not a fraction pointer. I'm catching that guy here in main. And then I'm using him directly because it's not a pointer, right? What's the downside to this? I'm not necessarily suggesting it's wrong. I'm just suggesting there's a consequence. What would you tell me is uh, the consequence of doing what I've done here? Why might we not want to do it this way and instead do it the scary way? It's not as pronounced in this particular example, but it is mathematically solvable. How long, how big is a long? 64 bits, eight bytes. How big is a long? 64 bits, eight bytes. So presumably we pretend like there's no additional overhead to building a structure, building a struct. At the very least, this guy weighs 16 bytes, right? Okay, 16 bytes, 128 bits, that's how much he weighs if I put it on a scale. How much does a memory address weigh? 64-bit operating system, maybe 64 bits. We looked at it earlier. We saw it's actually 48 bits. It's the operating system reserves some for the super user. But even if we assume it's the full weight in a 64-bit operating system, this thing weighs 64 bits. This thing weighs 128 bits, Right. So we're passing more data when we're passing around the actual thing than if we're passing around the memory address. Typically, the whole reason we might use pointers outside of access, outside of being able to make updates to something actually up in memory, the whole reason we might use pointers is because they're lighter weight to pass around. And we've used the example in class that you know, if you're having a party at your house, you don't hand them the house, you give them the address where they can find your house because houses are heavy. Now, in this example, a fraction is heavier than a memory address, but it's not all that heavy yet, right? All right, so we can say, all right, well, I'm only holding two numbers, two longs. Yeah, it weighs, let's just call it twice as much as a memory address. Maybe that's not a big deal. Okay, well, maybe. Well, it depends how many fractions you're dealing with, right? You can only deal with, in whatever your computer memory is, you can only deal with half as many fractions if you're passing them around like this rather than passing around memory addresses, right? Because you're storing the full-fledged fraction somewhere and you're going to dig into the amount of memory that you uh, have in your computer by passing around the full-fledged fractions, copies of those fractions, rather than working with the same fraction, because that's what we have here is we have a copy. So this guy basically got returned as an in integer type thing. If I make a change to it, that change is not permanent. So after 
for for the split second before this um, uh, function ends, before it gets automatic garbage collected. Sometimes automatic garbage collection does not happen immediately. It's kind of this background process where there's this truck kind of rolling back and forth, looking for abandoned memory locations, cleaning it up, but it still gets flagged. It is flagged for garbage collection, which is why we get the get no value out of it. Um, but for that split second, after we hit return here, there's actually the fraction exists twice, right? We Because we, we created a, a new fraction in here, and then we returned a copy of that fraction only for this guy to get garbage collected and for that copy to arrive back in main for us to use. That makes some sense, All right? Now, this isn't necessarily wrong. The issue is we just wanna be aware that there's a consequence to this decision. One consequence is we're passing around something that's a little heavier than a memory address. It's not that much heavier, probably not the end of the world, or at the very least, we should be wary, but not necessarily afraid you know, depending on the kind of problem we're solving. But the second side effect now is that we no longer are working with, which doesn't come into play here, but we're no longer working with a pointer. We no longer have something that exists once and we have a whole bunch of different ways of getting to it. We have variables that hold that same memory address. So we can talk about the same place in memory from 10 different, <laughs> if I handed each of you a post-it note with my address on it, Every single one of you has a pointer to my house, right? Yet the house only exists once. And that's far, far, far more efficient than me handing each of you a copy of my house. Make sense? So you see how quickly that would get out of hand? Um, so this is a micro version of that. But as a programmer, this is something that, especially as an old school program, we want to be aware of. Okay, Because we go back to that Y2K thing where... You know, we represented all the years as two-digit things, and then all of a sudden, the the uh, the century changed, <laughs> or the 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 uh, um, not just the century, but you 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 get it. We we flipped over to a um, uh, to the two thousand, so uh, that broke everything because now two thousand and nineteen hundred are no longer distinguishable in a two-digit year. And we originally did that to save memory. We're less inclined to care about memory today. Um, because we feel like we have a lot of memory. That's less of a daily constraint. Every now and then we do run into issues where memory does is a consequence. But in general, for 99.9% .9 of the problems you're going to solve during your careers, if you go into you know, a software developer in the business world, you probably don't need to worry about being overly memory efficient. You got plenty of RAM and you just move on with life. But at the very least, as computer scientists, we want to appreciate the consequence of these decisions. Newer languages like Java and C Sharp remove the option from us. They don't allow us to be potentially a bad programmer. C++ would allow me to hand each of you a copy of my house. It would let me do that if I wanted to. Just like right now, I'm handing out copies of these fractions. Okay. So, and I guess if I stored large enough numerators and denominators, I have to have I would have to switch to another representation for numerators and denominators, um, you know, because a long can only hold uh, two to the sixty plus or minus two to the sixty third power, big number but not an infinite number. So I could upgrade from that if I want to hold something that's bigger than whatever it was nine point five quintillion. If I want to hold bigger numbers than that. There are other options where we can go into things that are linked list based uh, data structures for representing arbitrary size values. They just get slower as the numbers get bigger, slower in working with them. So I could create a fraction that weighs as much as a house. It would be possible if I wanted to go down that street to really drive this point home. Okay, but C++ allows a programmer to metaphorically hand a copy of the house to everybody in this room and just be incredibly memory inefficient. And let's say that once in a blue moon, that might be something you want to do. And I think I had mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. Um, this might be something you want to do. In more modern languages, Java, C Sharp, for example, they make these decisions for you. 
objects are always, always, always passed by address. Structs no longer exist. And we'll talk about why here when we make the transition, when we upgrade our structs to objects. We're getting ready to start writing uh, an object-oriented version of fractions, which you're going to see is just a, a little hop, skip, and a jump upgrade from this guy. As we start, we're kind of walking through history here, and we're seeing where does one thing kind of come up short? Where do we need to invent an upgrade to it? So we kind of saw this here with our example of fractions, where we said, hey, I want to be able to represent fractions in my code. Well, in order to do that, I'm going to need to remember two different variables, a numerator and a denominator. It's not the end of the world, but it certainly would be convenient if I could pass around fractions as a single variable rather than two different variables. Make sense? It's reasonable enough. And we can certainly imagine how that would get more and more out of hand if we were trying to represent something that had 40 values. And all of a sudden you have to write functions that take 40 different parameters rather than one with the 40 things embedded inside of it. Make some sense? All right, so newer languages will do some of this for us. And then in a kind of in a back alley way, they do allow us to do the copy fakesy thing. Uh, most of these modern languages like Java, they have a function built into the top level object called clone that basically just tells the operating system, whatever's at this memory address, just duplicate it and put it at a different memory address. Now there's two of them. We're working with copies. So we, we can sort of in a roundabout way accomplish it for that 0.01% of the time that we might want to do something along those lines. So we could probably say the modern languages are better from that perspective. But we're going to appreciate why they're better as opposed to, oh, this is just magically the way it works. All right. So in this example, you can kind of decide which of the two you prefer. Um, If we're being true to computing, we should probably do this one um, and create our own memory and pass around what's technically the lighter uh, thing, right? Pass around the 48-bit uh, um, memory address rather than the 128-bit fraction. So we're going to go ahead and do that, but I wanted to drive that point home. Because I'm guessing most of you did your homework based off of this one as your starting point, right? Okay. I did want to put that out there because I had a couple of questions uh, about that from folks, and I wanted to give you that example. So now I'm back to a pointer. So now I'm back to the arrows. And I've allocated the memory myself. Therefore, now I am responsible for uh, for this. And just to give you a little foreshadowing where we're going with this is the ability to do something like this fraction pointer f2 is equal to new fraction numerator comma denominator return f2 that's what we're eventually going to be moving towards now that looks less scary right i promise you this new keyword is a synonym for malloc this is syntactic sugar for all this crap. It just does it for you behind the scenes. This is the object-oriented version of fraction that we're going to be uh, looking at, if not today, uh, on Thursday. Okay? So we are going to a less scary place, but we wanted to see the uh, the scare tactics first because, I don't know, it's fun for me to see the, the faces and then this guy spending more than 60 hours this weekend just makes my day, really. <laughs> Did you really spend that long? <laughs> That's that. That is true. Well, but it was Thursday, at Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and Monday. You had four days. Still a lot, but less a lot. All right. So I'm going to keep it in our uh, uh, in our. We're in charge of memory format like I had given you. I know I changed this from F1 to F2, but let it roll. Um, we need to make sure we update our function down here to return a fraction pointer. 
We need to make sure we update our prototype to return a fraction pointer. I'm basically putting it back to where I had started class today uh, as. Um, and then down here, we're going to be getting a fraction pointer, and now we're back to our arrow. Okay. The code has been returned to the functional state that it was in 20 minutes ago now. But we, everybody kind of follow what we just talked about. It, it is important stuff, especially when you run into that, that tiny problem, tiny percent of the problem where you do need to understand what's happening under the hood. And that's what differentiates you from as a computer scientist, as opposed to somebody who went through like a coding boot camp or something like that. Cause you're not going to see under the hood. You're just going to you know, be able to do that, that the surface level stuff. All right. So we have our fraction. Now we're supposed to write uh, what add fraction. So struct fraction pointer, add fraction. This guy will take in a fraction pointer F. Go and write this guy. So um, uh, actually needs taken two fractions, right? <laughs> so uh, you only have to take in one fraction when we start writing this in an object oriented way. That'll make sense when we talk about it. All right, so let me shimmy this um let's copy this whole thing all right so then we're gonna have to get our our uh, new numerator our new denominator so we find our common denominator first um uh, one limitation we do have in our, our current implementation is we do need, we are making the assumption that our two denominators when multiplied together still fits inside of a log. So if we have two gigantic values, 9.2 quintillion, <laughs> and we multiply 9.2 quintillion with against 9.2 quintillion, we end up with a value larger than what a 64-bit value can hold. So don't do that when you're testing your program, <laughs> okay? So, makes sense what the issue is. It almost always comes back to a memory thing or something that's happening under the hood. So we'll call this guy common, denom, and this guy will be f1 dot denominator times f2 dot denominator i know i still call that dot but the arrow thingy majiggy is the version of dot for when you're dereferencing a pointer all right we're working with pointers here and since we're working with pointers we access its members by using the arrow instead of a dot to avoid that these two things do the same stuff. All right, so that's our common denominator. And now we do our, uh, um, our cross multiplication, right? So we'll say uh, long, um, call this guy num1 is equal to F1 denominator times F2 numerator long noon two is equal to f2 denominator times f1 numerator um then we'll say long new num i'm just really spelling it out here in a bunch of variables num one plus num two then we'll say fraction answer out there we'll say fraction pointer answer um we do have the same issue here again right where we need to create the memory uh for passing around pointers so i'll come down here steal that dude real quick so when i create my result I'm going to give it some memory. 
just like we did uh, down there. All right. So now I can say answer arrow numerator is equal to new num answer dot denominator is equal to common denom and then we'll return answer. All right. So that's our add fraction. Uh, we need to now be able to display fractions to test this, right? So we'll go ahead and add that function. So we're going to have void display fraction. This guy will take in a fraction pointer as a parameter. Here. And this guy is just going to spit it out to the screen. So we'll say C out F numerator followed by, uh, you can put a space, not put a space, pick your poison, F denominator. All right, that's display fraction. So we can go ahead and test this here real quick. So we get our fraction. Uh, let's make a couple of fractions. We'll call this guy F1. That'll be one half. We'll call this guy F2. This will be three fourths, something like that. Then we'll say struct fraction pointer answer is equal to F, oh, actually to add fraction, probably should be called add fractions, but whatever, I'll pass it F1 and F2. And then we'll say answer display fraction. Oh, it's not that. We're going object oriented there. It's that. Display fraction takes in a fraction as a parameter. The way I just wrote it will be the object oriented way we would write it. So there's our 10 eighths. All right. And then we're going to write reduce fraction. Um, let's see, did we reduce fraction? We had our reduced fraction return a new fraction, right? We didn't reduce it in space in place. Fraction pointer reduce fraction fraction pointer F. All right, let me go and steal Euclidean algorithm. Just paste that guy in there real quick so I can do my do my math with it. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, um, uh, we'll put it into variables for this. So we'll say long B is equal to F denominator. We'll say uh, um, uh, long A is equal to F numerator. And now we can just write this uh, thing as is. So while B is not equal to zero, we're going to set a variable long T equal to the current value of B. Then we'll say B is equal to the current value of A mod the current value of B. Then we'll set A to whatever T was. 
keep doing that over and over and over again when this is done um we have a uh um the we have a value stored in a that is the greatest value that even the divides both a and b all right let me get rid of this guy So now I'll go ahead and say long new numerator. Num is equal to F numerator divided by A. Long new denom is equal to F denominator divided by A. Because A is the greatest value that even divides both of them. And then I will return create fraction of new num, new denom. Oh. And create fraction does return a uh, pointer, right? Yep. All right. So we'll come into reduce fraction. We'll remember our numerator and denominator. We just happened to put them inside variables that had the same name as the Euclidean algorithm we copied. You didn't have to do that, but that's what we did. So you go through this magical math. The magical math ultimately puts A in the position of being the largest value that even divides both the numerator and the denominator. We then divide the numerator and the denominator by that value, storing it inside of our new numerator, new denominator. We create a brand new fraction with that new numerator and a new denominator. We then return that fraction. So then in here, I can go ahead and say answer is equal to reduce fraction. And I'll pass it answer. So we'll overwrite answer with the, uh, the updated uh, answer. And then we'll say display fraction answer. And there's our five fourths. All right. Does that solve all the is that all the functions we're supposed to write for the assignment? Am I missing something? All right, so let me just copy that code. I'll throw it up on Slack. Call this guy struct fraction solution. What was this homework? 13. All right, so that's up on Slack if you want to look at the code more closely and see where you went. When you where you zigged when you should have zagged something like that. All right, questions about that. See, I told you this stuff is simple. Where are the headaches? The headaches are in the little tiny minutiae syntax, right? It's not the math. It's missing an arrow here, missing a star there, missing a semicolon here. Reps, reps reps, and you'll make less and less errors. And then you'll have new errors that you make with more difficult things. So the things that you find difficult next week will be things that you found, you know, uh, difficult that will be things that you find easy next week will be things you found difficult this week and so on and so forth. Hopefully you're all seeing some level of that. Maybe it's not week to week, but maybe if you look back to what you struggled with week three of class, week four of class, you might find that fairly trivial now because you've gone on to much more difficult stuff. And it's same thing. That's where I relate it to sports. All right. So any questions about structs? Our little pit stop at structs here. All right. So Here's the situation. So let's go to our What is wrong with structs? All right. So remember we're kind of going on a, like a, a hike through history 
And in the very early days of computers, the problems we were trying to solve with them were not overly complex. Computers weren't anywhere near as fast as they are today. They've always been way, way, way faster than a human. Um, but you know, we we hadn't really started trying to apply computers to all sorts of problems. So as computers got faster, as we started trying to solve more and more problems with computers, we started noticing weaknesses in our original programming languages. For instance, before structs, we had no way of storing more than one value inside of a single variable name. Well, unless we used arrays. Make some sense? And then we had to remember what bucket zero represented, what bucket one represented. So we're going to call structs an upgrade to that. Um, well, then we're using structs for a while. This is all fine and dandy. But based on what you've seen so far, what would you, can you point out any weaknesses of structs? Anything that you wish you can do in a struct that uh, um, we just can't yet? And you've kind of seen me stumble upon uh, jumping ahead a little bit a couple times today. Structs can hold values, but what can't they hold? So far in programming, we've we've done several different things. We've created variables, right? We've created functions. Structs can't hold functions. So if I have things that are very, very, very related to fractions, like we have here, we've had to take our functions that are going to perform operations on fractions, and we had to throw those in the main. So all we're doing is we're bringing to the table this, um, you know, this fancier array, right? We're bringing a struct to the table that just holds our numerator and denominator instead of inside of a single package. But we still need to toss that to these functions that live external to that, right? Again, not the end of the world if you're solving relatively small problems, but replace fraction with something much scarier, something where you might have, I don't know, 200 functions that are operating with it, right? All of a sudden, our uh, main program here starts looking pretty scary when the reality is main is really the part that drives our program. All programs begin and end with main. If we had our uh, option, we would probably choose to stuff as many of these fraction-related things into a fraction. So that all we saw in main here was just us telling fractions what to do. Make sense? This goes back to week one or two of class when we had the object-oriented versus the procedural telephone, right? Right now, our fractions look like a bunch of wires. Because the way we're working with fractions has all these wires floating around. What we want to do is we want to move towards having fractions that uh, are self-contained. All right. So we're going to start doing that. And we're going to do this by creating new files. So I'm going to create a file called fraction HPP. And I'll talk about why that in a second. I'm going to create another file called fraction CPP. All right. Now, for starters, it isn't 100% required to do this across two files, but it is how it historically has been done, and it is for a good reason. Um. Here's an example right here. We don't know what's inside of time.h, but notice here we've included time.h. That was for our random number generator thingy. So a .h file is a header file related to C programs. So time must have been a program that they wrote um, in C years ago, long time ago. And we want to bring in the stuff related to that here. What is inside of the header file is effect is effectively all of these prototypes, not the implementations. Okay, so there's a bunch of things that look like that, which is four lines long in our example here, 
as opposed to all of that stuff, which is a lot longer than four lines of code. So what we're doing is we're separating the prototypes from the actual implementation. And what does that allow us to do as a programmer? It allows us to, if we want to see how to use an object, all we have to do is glance in the header file and we see all of its abilities. We don't necessarily see how they were implemented. Those go in the CPP file, but we don't have to start digging through that file looking for stuff unless we're looking for a bug or, or something like that. We can look at the features of it entirely through the header file and not have to worry about all that implementation. So it's in a way, a way of self-documenting your code. Make some sense? So this is historically the way uh, uh, that it has worked. Now, what's kind of funny is when you go to more modern languages like Java, C Sharp, these languages do not have header files. Um, Java is a good example. So Java came out before C Sharp. So it, uh, you know, it looked at how can we make things better than C++? What are the problems with C++? So one of the things that took away was the pointer syntax. They said C++ programmers, they don't like screwing around with all the asterisks and the ampersands and the arrows and the dots. And when do I use one versus the other? All the stuff that I've been making you do, right? And how many of you don't want to deal with that anymore? Most of you, right? Okay. It, it, you can appreciate the geekiness, but if life got a little easier and we replaced your stick shift with an automatic transmission, you wouldn't complain, right? So, and, we're, and we are heading in that direction, I promise. Okay. But another thing that Java did is it took away the need for a header file. And instead, it just has you define all your stuff inside of the a single file. You would have a separate file for your fraction that we're creating here, but you wouldn't have two files. You wouldn't have one file that said, here's the stuff fractions can do, and then another file that actually implemented those things. And the reason was Java had built into it this uh, thing called Javadoc. And let me show you something here. Um, we'll just do Java string. That'll take us to a good place. All right, so here's some Java documentation. And what we're seeing here for Java, you have fields, you have constructors, blah, blah, blah. You have method summaries. Um, but this format that we're seeing here was generated by a tool called Javadoc. So what you would do with the people who wrote the string class for Java, what they did is before their functions, they wrote like a, a it's almost like another language embedded inside of Java that had some directives in it that gave Javadoc, the program, enough information to generate this HTML file that looks like this. With the idea that, oh, all Java programmers will just add the Javadoc syntax into their code before their functions and things like that. And then when they actually release the software, they would run that through Javadoc, creating this documentation, which effectively fulfills the role of a header file. Here's a list of all of the functions that live inside of it, but we don't see the implementation of the two lowercase function here. We just know that there is one and we know that this is what it returns and we know that this is what it does. So this is documentation. This is effectively those header files. Make sense? We have one problem. Java developers don't use Javadoc. <laughs> We're too lazy, right? None of it, we typically don't even like using uh, more than one character long variable names. So I'm trying to push on you the idea of use variable names that are meaningful, right? And then use function names that are meaningful. Try to put a comment here and there when you need to remind, really remind yourself of what's going on. If you're working, if you're working on a team on a large project, you might want to put a little bit more verbose comments if, you know, you know, your your coworker is going to be looking at your code in two weeks and needing to work with it. And you've done some weird stuff in here that isn't self-explanatory. You might want to throw a couple of lines of comments in there that say, this is what I'm doing here. You know, we can see an example of that right here. If you're a random programmer that stumbled upon this code right here, you might look at that and say, what the heck? What am I doing? 
right? The reality is we probably should say determine the GCD, which is the greatest common divisor, the I, right? Of numerator and denominator and store in A. It might be nice if we'd done something like that. And maybe I would actually do that. Just put it on two lines, a little bit easier to read. That might have been nice. But again, we didn't. We just threw random, weird-looking mathy code right in the middle of our thing and just assumed, ah, just trust this works. Don't let the other programmer who might look at this uh, uh, get any hint of what we're doing. Um, but that's kind of how programmers work. So there's a difference between what we actually do and what we probably should do. So what I'm encouraging you to do is maybe do half the stuff and you're probably doing better than most, right? I'm gonna tell you all the stuff you should do. And then I'm gonna say, do as I say, but not as I do, because I don't comment very much stuff. Um, it's wasted keystrokes, right? Uh, but that's a reality. So the idea is when Java came out, uh, the idea was Java programmers would include the Java to Java doc directives in all their code so that when they ran it through Java doc, it would generate effectively the same thing as a header file is. But nobody does it. Or at least not commonly. Some people do. All right. So that's why we use header files. Um, and I think you'll find, especially as your programs start getting larger and larger and larger, that they are very helpful. The only problem for us is now we're, we're having to juggle extra files, right? Just know that the header files, the HPP files, that's the header file for a C++ program. That's where your prototypes live and your uh, uh, CPP files are where your code lives, the implementation. All right. So we'll go into our fraction HPP. And we're going to now introduce the idea of a class. We're going to start inventing our own objects. Just like we invented a brand new variable uh, type last time with a struct, we're going to now start inventing our own objects. So we're going to just throw in here, can't hold functions. And that's actually um, mostly true, but near the end before object-oriented programming kind of became a thing, some uh, creative C++ programmers sort of kind of found a way to use pointers to point to functions. So you could sort of embed functions, pointers to functions inside of your structs and kind of accomplish it, but it was like a workaround, duct tape, if you will. So now we have something called a class. This is the structure we use to define objects in an object-oriented programming language. We it's the same name, whether we're dealing with C++, Java, C Sharp, they're called classes. All right. A class is a collection of fields, Construct constructors and functions. I'm going to put the word methods after that. Naming convention is once we start working with stuff inside of objects, we happen to call the functions methods. It's like a, a thing. It, they mean the same thing. Function method, they use the same thing. I'm mainly saying it here because sometimes I'll just say them interchangeably. So whether I say function or whether I say method, I'm talking about the exact same thing. All right. So a class is a collection of these things. What are the fields? These are the variables that are owned by the class. What are constructors? These are the special I'm going to still say functions here. These are the special functions that allow us to initialize a variable of this class type. 
So if you want to keep that, contextualize that, that constructor solves the same problem as our create fraction function. Put my fraction together. So when we create an instance of a fraction, I'm going to hand in a numerator, I'm going to hand in a denominator. Internally, its constructor will put those pieces together. <laughs> Make sense? All right. So that's what constructors are. And constructors, though, do not have return types, and that'll make sense here in a few minutes. All right, so that's what constructors are. And you could have more than one constructor. In fact, in case you want to build fractions a couple of different ways, or you want to build your object a couple of different ways, um, if you want to think about a real life example of this, if you uh, are building a house, you know, you can hire a contractor. And what does he need to build your house? Probably a bunch of money, right? So he can construct a house for you given a giant check. Or you and a buddy could be building a house. And what do you need? You need the supplies to build the house. You need the wood, the nails, all this other stuff. So there are two different ways you can accomplish building a house. So you might have two constructors if you were writing the code for that. One that takes in a dollar amount or the internally it just goes and figures it out. The contractor goes and figures it out. The other one says, here's all the crap you need. Now you get to put together the puzzle to, to build the house. All right. So you can have more than one constructor, although early on, we're probably going to commonly only have a single constructor. Um, and I'll go ahead and throw this out there. Constructors always have the same name as the class name. And this is case sensitive. And I'll throw in there that, um, actually, I'll say this. This is true for most languages. So C++, Java, C Sharp, when you make constructors in all those languages, they have the same name as the class. Uh, an example of a language that does not is uh, a language called Objective-C which is one of the early Apple uh, languages. Um, in that one, constructors are commonly called like init, I-N-I-T, or init with numerator and denominator might be something like that. So it, they actually are just functions, normal functions that happen to do the initialization. Whereas in uh, uh, C++, Java, C Sharp, um, constructors are special functions. They're, they don't have a return type. And, and again, I'll tell you why in a, in a few minutes. Um, but they are built specifically to initialize that variable. Okay. And these functions, these guys operate on the, call it members of the class, as well as do other logic like what we have already done in our functions. All right. So let's see this by example. So we'll go into our fraction HPP. We are going to build here a class called fraction. That's how you should start it. Class. The name of your class, class names typically have an uppercase letter to start them. It's not a rule, it's just a naming convention. Functions typically start with a lowercase letter. And we've seen like the camel case thing. Um, I think I did it in here, hopefully it did in here. Create fraction, you kind of, your individual words, you, you capitalize after the first one. That's a naming convention for writing functions. Classes typically have an uppercase letter. By following those conventions, which most people do, um, it does allow you to quickly identify what kind of animal you're dealing with when you see it. If you see something that starts with a lowercase thing, it's probably a variable or something like that. If you see an uppercase, it's probably the name of a class. All right. So that's our starting point. So you can think of this like as a, the 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 group the, the bag that's holding all the stuff related to our fractions. 
All right. So initially, we're going to have our fields. These are the things we need to remember inside of our fraction. All right. Now I'm going to do this. Um, let's say the, uh, the 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 wrong way first, and then we'll show the right way. So I'm just going to create a section here called public. The two sections that you're going to see for uh, initially are going to be public and private. The difference is, is who has access to those variables. Right now, I'm going to make everything public so everybody has access to them. And then I'll show you why that's a problem or why that's, a let's say, a, a, a bad idea. Lazy programmers might do that. So we're going to say that a fraction has a numerator and a fraction has a denominator. All right. Now, so actually, let me, let me change this. I'm going to do that guy right there. I'm going to label those as my fields. Those are the variables associated with this guy. Now I'm going to have my constructor. Constructors have the same name as the class names. So this is going to be fraction. Now, again, I'm going to do this in the wrong way first, and then I'll show you the, the better way of doing it. So I'm going to say int num. I'm sorry, it's long. Long num, long denom. We can all agree here that numerator and denominator are the best names to name your variables that are holding the numerator and the denominator. And we have arbitrarily given them separate names here. And I'll show you why here in a second. So now I'm going to take that line right there, our prototype. We've worked with this before, right? These are our prototypes. I'm going to go into our fraction CPP file. And at the very top here, I'm going to include fraction.hpp. And notice I have this guy in double quotes. Instead of those angle brackets that we saw before, double quotes mean it's our stuff. We wrote it. Look in the current directory. Make sense? All right. So we want this guy to become aware of fraction HPP. Now, what's actually happening? It's taking this class stuff here, and it's just throw, it's replacing this line with all that crap. So nothing actually keeps you from putting all this inside of one file and uh, um, just referencing it at the bottom. But it's also a bad idea because you might have other classes that want to use your fraction. And you need to have a way of referencing the things that fractions have in them. So we're doing that the correct way. We're, we're storing it inside of our header file. And anybody who needs access to the fraction stuff includes fraction HPP at the top lets them know about it, just like we've included time.h in here, where we haven't even looked at that. We just know we need the time thing to do our um, uh, random number generation seed. Okay? So in here, this is where we're going to, we're going to implement the fraction functions. And we do that Actually, the way I would usually do it is I would steal this here, copy it, bring it over here, put it in there. And then before that, you have to put in the class followed by a colon colon for who owns it. This is what links these two files together. All right. This file knows about our fraction prototypes. This is where I'm implementing that constructor. And this is how I'm linking it to that prototype. So inside of here, we're going to say numerator equals num, denominator equals denom, just like that. Where did numerator and denominator come from? They were listed here inside of our header file which got embedded inside this guy with that line right there. 
So you can kind of think of there is an imaginary stuff up here. And a couple of those things are these two lines. So we have global variables inside of the fraction class called numerator and denominator. And what I've done with those two guys is I'm now setting, I'm initializing. Remember the job of a constructor? The job of a constructor is to initialize this particular instance of an object. In this case, fraction. What does it mean to initialize a fraction? Set its numerator and denominator. And then it, we can call that a fraction. If we see something sitting here and it has a numerator and denominator, we would identify that guy as a fraction. Cool? All right. Now, right off the bat, we look at this and this seems fishy. Why is my uh, field called numerator, yet my parameter is called num? I'll show you why. What if my parameter was called numerator? Now I'm setting numerator equal to numerator. Which numerator am I setting to which numerator? Well, we already have the answer to this. All of, why do you bother me so much? Why are you telling me about pizza? Slice my pizza, fractions, enrichment, math lessons. <laughs> All right, so... We know how to deal with this because this comes back to our scoping rules, right? Variables resolve to their most local definition. If I say the word numerator right here and I have the word numerator up there, what is the most local definition of a variable called numerator? It's this guy, not this guy. What we really want to do though is we want to set this guy equal to whatever was passed in here. So a inexperienced programmer would just name them differently, right? Because now I can come down here and I can say, well, I'm setting the lo most local definition of numerator, which I don't find here. Instead, I find it up here. I'm setting that guy equal to the most local definition of num, which I find right there. We've solved the problem by naming them differently, which we're going to say is a bad idea. So just in the last second here, I'm just going to show you the fix, and then we'll talk about it in detail next time. So I'm going to call this guy numerator here. And what we would do is we would say this numerator is equal to numerator. We're going to learn about the this keyword here next class. And I'll tell you that the punchline is this is how an object refers to itself from within itself. We are inside of the implementation of fraction right now. So when a fraction wants to talk about themselves, they say this. It's equivalent to any of us saying me, mine, I. Make sense? All right. No homework for Thursday, but try to wrap your mind around this stuff. The homework assignment over the weekend will be something related to objects. It depends on how far I go with the fraction stuff for uh um uh with our with our previous example. All right. I will see everybody on and here I'll uh I'll give you a copy of the current version of the code, even though it's incomplete. Incomplete. So for the example solution for application, okay. 